Okay, this is our second part of Chapter 4, uh, talking about the integumentary system, and we've made it up to the portion on the appendages of skin. The first things that we're going to talk about are our glands, and we have sebaceous glands, which produce oil, uh, an oily substance called sebum, actually, which functions uh, as a lubricant for skin. It makes the skin more soft and pliable. It prevents brittle hair. Um, and it kills bacteria. Now, these glands have ducts that empty into hair follicles uh, and others that open directly on the skin surface. Um, these glands are activated at puberty. So, you know, when we're young, um, we're fine, and then at puberty, suddenly we become these greasy, greasy teens. Now, the sebaceous glands, um, we have these materials that do all this stuff for us. And uh, like I said, lubricant skin prevents brittle hair. And then we wash all of this off and we actually replace that now with other um, substances, you know, lotions and stuff like that. But it is reasonable that our body would make something like this. We are only about 10,000 years out from cavemen and we were in a lot of dirt and there are a ton of pathogens in dirt you go you pick up a pinch of soil and you've got about a billion microorganisms there so having this uh, material that had this antibacterial property and antifungal property was very helpful to us well these glands you can see located uh, deep within the dermis and again it's usually in association with some sort of hair follicle. We have other types of uh, glands which are sweat glands. Well, these produce sweat. They are located all over the skin. Um, there are two types. There's eccrine and apocrine. Eccrine these are active early on and continue throughout life. They open via a duct to the pore on the skin. The apocrine uh, also have ducts that empty into hair follicles. And the best I can say is that these are kind of uh, the, the stinky glands. They are in the groin and in the armpit. And uh, I shouldn't say stinky in, in a, a typical sense. They're, they're release of pheromonal material. Um, it is a little oilier. It has a lot of cholesterol, uh, but it does have a odor to it. Now, this is an eccrine gland. This is your typical sweat gland. Now, eccrine sweat is mo made mostly of water. Uh, it does have some salts and vitamin C. Vitamin C is uh, an acid and the salts also function as a means of killing microorganisms. We get rid of some metabolic wastes and it has some fatty acids and proteins in the apocrine sweat. It, the big function in the eccrine sweat is to help dissipate excess heat, uh, excrete waste products, and that acid nature will inhibit bacterial growth. So microorganisms that have to live in our body's pH, which is slightly basic, 7.35, 7.45, that acid kills a lot of that. Now, the odor that we associate with most sweat is from bacteria eating the sweat and its bacterial byproducts that really smell. You may have noticed that when you first start sweating, it's not that noticeable. But after a few hours, that's when it sort of gets a little funky. And if that's left on the body for an extended period of time, then it gets uh, just a lovely scent. I had a professor who had a theory about human survival. And he said that... Uh, Truthfully, we're not the fastest animal in the world. We can't outrun very much at all. I can't even outrun a, a dachshund. So the fact is that anything that wants to catch us can. 
we don't have sharp claws, we don't have long teeth, we don't have a lot of natural protection. But what we do have is sweat. And the fact is that humans smell bad. Um, that funky odor that I was talking about, you know, if that's left unwashed, you, you smell. And there are very few things that want to eat us because of that. Um, there are other animals that sweat. They don't smell as bad as we do. Um, so we are kind of the prey of last choice for a lot of animals. Uh, they would rather eat something else than deal with us. And I think that that's a, probably a pretty accurate thing because um, there are a number of animals that avoid their predators by putting out a smell. Possums play dead and they put out a smell that smells slightly like rotten flesh. Um, the skunk squirts and runs animals off with its smell. So it kind of made sense to me. Anyway, we have additional appendages of skin, which are hairs. These are produced by hair follicles. It's made of keratinized epithelial cells, but they are really heavily keratinized. There are melanocytes that provide pigment to hair color, and depending on how much melanin is put in, we can have a lot of color, and we can have dark brown or black hair uh, to lighter shades of brown. There are some additional materials that can also be put into hair that will alter their color a little bit. So someone who has blonde hair has a higher level of sulfur in their hair. People with red hair actually have iron deposits uh, in their hair. When we age, the melanocytes that uh, put the color into the hair start to die off, so our hair gets lighter and grayer and so forth. Now, people who have white hair, they actually are getting bubbles uh, air bubbles in their hair, which gives it that uh, really bright white appearance. Now, I'm not going to ask you to know the structure of a hair follicle, uh, but we do have melanocytes right in the follicle that are feeding into the hair cells itself. It is, again, heavily keratinized. I'm not going to let you tell you to worry about this. Now, aside from the hair follicle, which is where hair grows from, and that part you should know, hairs come from a hair follicle, there are some additional materials or d additional structures associated with um, hair. We have a muscle that is called the erector pili muscle. This is a smooth muscle, so it's under involuntary control. It is, uh, what happens is it will pull the hair upright when we are cold or when we're frightened. Now, this is, okay, so the erector pili muscle. Um, well, it certainly serves a purpose. Uh, it just doesn't serve a very good one in humans. Um, but in other animals that have a whole lot of hair, this is a huge benefit. Now, what will happen, uh, air is a great insulator, and by pulling the hairs upright, there's a lot more air trapped. Now, humans just, there aren't, there are a few humans who have a lot of hair. Uh, admittedly, the guys, uh, occasionally you'll see them walking down the beach and you think they have a sweater on. But for the most part, we just don't have that much hair. So that doesn't help us that much. Um, the same thing with being frightened. Um, I have a dog, a couple of dogs. I have a couple of cats. And the first time my cats met the dogs, um, well this little bitty bitty cat suddenly the hair went foom and the cat looked twice as big as it had just a few seconds before so now my dog 
is faced with something that appears to have gotten suddenly bigger. And beyond that, um, with the hair sticking out now, vital organs, it's hard to tell exactly where the neck is. So the dog might try to attack, but would only get a handful or a mouthful of fur. So having those hairs stand up um, certainly serves an advantage in other animals. And humans, again, not as much. And if we don't get much benefit from a feature, it eventually goes away. And I suspect that these erector pili muscles eventually are going to disappear just because they're not doing us that much good. Uh, kind of like the uh, blind fish that are in Mammoth Cave. Their eyes no longer function because they have no need for them in a dark environment like that. Additional materials associated with hair or structures associated with hair include sebaceous glands which we've already talked about which release material into the hair follicle and then sweat glands. The overall structure looks again something like this. So we have a hair, we have an erector pili muscle which will tighten up to cause that hair to stand up. We have glands associated with the hair as well. This is a close-up photo of a uh, hair and you can see the scale-like quality to the hair. These are flattened out dead hair cells or dead cells that have just been tightly packed and filled with mel melanin. One of our other appendages of the skin are nails. And these are scale-like modifications of the epidermis. They are literally very much like scales. Uh, in fact, hairs are kind of have the structure of scales as well. These are heavily keratinized, and that little half moon that you see in the nail bed is the stratum basale, which is responsible for growth. And that half moon is referred to as the lanula. Um, this is one area that lacks pigment, and this is really good because it allows us to evaluate circulation well. In fact, if someone is in uh, surgery, they're going to put a pulse oximeter there where they can take and uh, evaluate the O2 saturation of the blood. When a doctor looks at your hands, one of the things that he's looking at is the fingernails. And if you give it a little squeeze, you can evaluate just how long does it take for the color to come back underneath the nail. So this is a good place to evaluate. Uh, if you are going into the healthcare professions, you have to keep your nails trimmed. And uh, if you're going into nursing, they're not going to want you to uh, have nail polish on. You wouldn't want nail polish on in surgeries, but oddly enough, nail polish uh, helps support the growth of certain pathogenic microorganisms and when you have your hands in gloves all day you can uh, actually uh, provide a good environment for them to grow with the fluids in the glove uh, this can just complicate things you can end up having infections uh, of your nail beds so the general structure of a uh, nail we have that free edge which you're familiar with. That's the part that picks stuff up. The body, which is the visible portion that's attached to the that we that we can see, um, and then we have a root or nail bed that's embedded in the skin, and it actually extends pretty far up underneath uh, in that first joint. There's a little roll of tissue, which is called the cuticle, and that's the fold that projects onto the nail body. Um, it has another word. It's called the epinechium. So, you know, if uh, you have a hangnail someday and don't want to go to work, just call your boss and say that you have a damaged epinechium. 
so this is our structure and as you can see the nail actually does extend quite a bit up under the nail bed um, if you've ever hit your finger with a hammer and then we, you know, a week or so later you get the wavy part of the bed start to show and that's because the damage may have occurred up here this is the lanula and that is one of those four words that I've mentioned before lanula that is that half moon we talked about lamellae and lacunae associated with bone there's another one which is lanugo which we'll talk about in a few minutes actually this is a good place to stop we're going to pick up now uh, on our our next section on skin color and skin color determinants and the diagnostic benefit uh, that we see with skin colors so this is our stopping place and I hope this helps.